nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, uh, let's continue. Um, and uh, today we're going to consider one of the uh, key elements, at least uh, for one particular architecture of uh, quantum photonics. In this case, the idea is that you would excite optically a uh, spin degree of freedom in uh, some uh, quantum emitter, like in this particular case, nitrogen vacancy in diamond. And we know that nitrogen vacancy has a long cleaving uh, spin uh, degree of freedom in, uh, at room temperatures. So then uh, you could basically create this uh, certain spin, uh, spin state which is, uh, you could interpret, like basically you put, uh, uh, record some quantum memory. And then you need to transmit this information. And the way you do it, it's just you couple it to surface plasma polyton uh, in the plasmonic waveguide, as it's shown here. So ideally, for example, you could excite with a single photon, certain spin state, and uh, the information about this spin state could be sent uh, with a single surface plasma polyton along uh, this plasmonic waveguide, which then converted into a single photon which would be detected, detected with single photon detector. Or just that detector could uh, um, uh, obtain this single plasmon polariton. So the idea that you control with light, uh, spin degree of freedom, you write uh, this qubit and you read it uh, Optically, but in this case, when we say optically, we mean that it propagates not in free space, but rather as a surface plasma polariton on a chip. Because ideally, we would like to have it on a chip. Um, one way or another, that probably would be uh, part of uh, any quantum photonic circuitry, an important one. So the question arises in this regard. We know that with plasmonic environment, we could, we could agree the uh, per cell factor. We could uh, have very high per cell factor, meaning that in this case, the, uh, for example, the emission of uh, single photon could be increased dramatically because of higher photonic density of states. But we don't know how the, uh, uh, this high per cell factor, or let's say plasmonic environment in general, would affect the spin contrast or spin state which you create. Because one thing is how you control the emission of single photons. And for that, we know that the higher per cell factor, the better. But what would happen with this spin uh, state which you create, or spin contrast? And uh, when I say spin contrast, I mean compared to the uh, state when it's, uh, to the uh, situation when it's not excited. So this is one of the problems to address. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, that uh, has not been really uh, much studied. And uh, we looked at, the, at this particular problem uh, in our group. Uh, last year. And another important uh, uh, part of this is how to precisely place nanodiamonds in a particular position. So if you, as I pointed out, uh, diamonds, of course, is a good diamond using diamond and color synthesis in diamonds. In principle, it's a good approach for uh, quantum photonic circuitry. But it's uh, relatively hard to integrate with uh, nanoelectronics. And uh, alternative way is to use nanodiamond and place them precisely in any position you want to. So that's uh, yet another problem, this precise uh, scalable position of nanodiamonds. And yet another one, you need to detect this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, signal by using single photon detector. Because as I said, ideally you do it all at the level of single quanta. So a single photon they create this uh, spin degree of freedom, and then you excite this single uh, surface plasma polariton, which is eventually detected with this uh, integrated single photon detector. That's the vision, and let's start with the spin contrast readout in plasmonic environment. This work was largely done by uh, my postdoc, Simeon Bogdanov, and as I said, he addressed the problem how this plasmonic environment would affect the um, spin uh, uh, the spin state. Uh, first of all, let's see how we create this spin state, how we create what we call spin contrast and what we call by spin contrast. So you could, uh, with a little bit simplification, you could uh, describe nitrogen vacancy in center uh, in with this uh, uh, schematic of energy levels. So there is uh, a spin, uh, uh, it's subsystem with projection of spin equal zero, and there is a, a subsystem uh, with projection of spin equal plus minus one. 
So you could say, hey, we're dealing with spin uh, zero subsystem and spin one subsystem. The separation between these two states is uh, 2.877 uh, gigahertz. And in principle, you could control it with microwave radiation. But if you excite it optically, and that's, uh, that's what we want to do, so you could consider this radiation emission of photons uh, for the emission for the spin uh, equal zero and for spin equal one. And in principle, if there wouldn't be this non-radiative channel, when you go from spin one subsystem to spin zero subsystem, this is a purely non-radiative, then it would be the same intensity. So you would not see any difference in a uh, photo emission for spin equal zero and spin equal one. But because so there is this channel, when you basically convert it from spin equal one to spin equal zero, then the uh, photo emission for this uh, subsystem would be somewhat less. So, for example, if you look at the fluorescence for the subsystem uh, with spin equal zero, you would get somewhat higher uh, fluorescence than in the case for, of subsystem with spin equal one. Because of this additional channel, non-radiative channel. Because there is no emission, but you go it from the upper state to the low electronic state, basically you convert from spin equal one to spin equal zero. So, and, uh, what actually happens when you optically pump this system, that because of this non-radiation, uh, non-radiative uh, transition, you effectively convert this system from spin equals uh, one to spin equals zero. Of course, this is very small di uh, difference, so you could, um, I mean, optically at room temperature, you excite both these states, you would have this Boltzmann distribution. But when you pump it optically, you convert it effectively for spin equal one to spin equal zero because of this non-radiative channel. So in what we call spin contrast, it's the difference between fluorescence uh, from subsystem zero with spin equal zero and subsystem with spin equal one. The difference uh, we call actually the uh, spin contrast. You see the fluorescence uh, in the case when you optically pump first, we call it initial fluorescence, so that you have actually converted to spin equal zero, you create certain spin state that could be thought as this kind of qubit. And, uh, but then you let the system go to the thermal equilibrium. So, and then you have this Boltzmann distribution between these two sublevels. And then the fluorescence would be somewhat different, somewhat less. Because in this case, you have the highest fluorescence. And the difference in fluorescence between these two states, we call spin contrast. Because that's what you optically create. You create certain spin state, which could be uh, considered as a memory. And you do it optically. So in principle, you could convert from this level to this one uh, by using microwave and uh, radiation. And that's what people uh, do quite often. In this case, you have very high sensitivity to DC magnetic field to AC magnetic field, because that's the way you uh, uh, do this transition between S equal zero and S equal one. And another simple way, which was proposed by my postdoc, Simeon, actually very elegant and simple, you just wait enough and that uh, it would go this through this thermal equilibrization uh, that basically two thirds would go to these states uh, and one third would stay here. The simple way and you would still get spin contrast. So, and that's what was measured. Basically, we would uh, place nano diamonds on a sapphire substrate. And in some cases we have these disks of titanium nitride. Remember I told you that titanium nitride, it's a good plasmonic material which supports uh, surface plasmon polaritons. And uh, surface plasmon polaritons, that's exactly that plasmonic environment I was talking about. And because of surface plasmon polariton, you have higher per cell factor and higher efficiency of emission. So therefore, what you observe here, if you look at the uh, photo emission from nanodiamonds, from nitrogen vacancy in nanodiamonds, in the case of titanium nitride, it, co it goes faster because of the uh, surface plasma polariton environment, because of this uh, uh, higher per cell factor, than in the case of pure substrate, just, which is just sapphire, sapphire. And then if you let your system relax, uh, meaning basically go through this uh, uh, thermal equilibrium, uh, then eventually some part of it will go to the, uh, from, uh, because optically you convert it to S equals zero, but then because of thermal uh, equilibrium, uh, part of this go to spin equal one. 
So, and that happens uh, on the much longer time, on the scale of uh, 100 microsecond, as you could see here. And that's what you obtain in terms of spin contrast. Again, spin contrast is a difference in fluorescence uh, when you first excite it just optically. And then you wait, you switch off light and wait when it goes to this thermal equilibrium and you get then new fluorescence. And that new fluorescence, the difference in the two fluorescences, we call spin contra contrast. And you could see that in the case of titanium nitride, when you have this plasmonic environment, the spin contrast is actually less. And ideally, we would like to have spin contrast uh, as high as possible, because that's what you excite with light. That might uh, information which I convert from light into spin. So, and the, um, the fact which we have to take into account that uh, plasmonic environment does increase, for example, if, uh, efficiency of generation of single photon. However, uh, in terms of spin contrast, it actually decreases in this particular case. That's something uh, important which needs to be taken into account. Here we plot spin contrast as a function of different nanodiamonds and depending where this nanodiamond sits because local environment could be different the orientation of dc moment and this and these centers have dc moments because remember i told you uh, they don't have center of symmetry they have dc moment because of that local photon density of states is different for different nanodiamonds but still on average in the case of when you look at the fluorescence from nanodiamond on Subfire pure substrate and compare it uh, for the case of titanium nitride when you excite the surface plasma and polariton that you do indeed have this smaller uh, spin contrast uh, as was just uh, recently stated. Well, Simeon developed a simple kinetic model uh, which basically looks the balance at, uh, uh, of population of different levels involved, this, all these uh, four levels involved, and it describes very well all the experimental observations. So the general tendency, uh, the shorter lifetime, and lifetime becomes shorter when you have stronger per cell, when the efficiency of emission increases, the smaller spin contrast. That's the tendency. So from one side, of course, plasmonic is great in terms of increasing efficiency of emission, higher photonic density of stage, therefore higher probability to be emitted into those states. But on the other hand, if you would like to, uh, to, to write this uh, information in this qubit, in this spin degree of freedom, the spin contrast actually drops with uh, increase of this plasmonic environment. Environment. I should say all this true when you work far from saturation. We are still looking what's going to happen at the high saturation. Our experimental setup didn't allow us to measure it at high saturation, meaning uh, very high intensity of pumps. But we are working on this, and we expect actually the conclusion would be somewhat different. But at least if you work relatively far from uh, the saturation, that's what we obtain. Spin contrast drops uh, with increase of the per cell factor. So again, this is the way we measure. We first initiate fluorescence by uh, first optical pump and look at the fluorescence. Remember what f first you do when you pump, you basically convert the system to S equals zero. And the uh, fluorescence goes largely from subsystem with S equals zero, and fluorescence is high, is high. Then you switch off pumping and wait when, when there is thermal equilibrium for like hundreds of microseconds. So, and then uh, part of the excitation goes from S equals zero to S equal one because of thermal equilibrium. And then you excite again the top chicken and look at new fluorescence, and fluorescence is less because uh, roughly a uh, certain part of excitation goes to subsystem with S equal 1. And the difference in the two fluorescents we call spin contrast. And with this approach, when we basically convert from S equal 0 to S equal 1 by simply switching on, uh, so to say, uh, thermal equilibrium, is actually pretty much equivalent to what other uh, groups used to do by using this uh, Rabi Pi flip basically by using this uh, microwave radiation, because if you send the pi flip, you completely convert it from S equal zero to S equal one. The difference is actually not uh, fundamental. With thermal equilibrium approach, you get two thirds uh, sitting in S equal one, and one third on S equal zero. And if you use pi pulse, then you would uh, convert everything, the whole excitation from S equal zero to S equal one. So the difference is this one third, which is of no principle, uh, value, I would say, in this case. And this system is much, uh, much more simple because it doesn't require microwave radiation at all. So, but the overall conclusion is that optical spin readout from uh, nitrogen vacancies in nanodiamonds requires careful engineering of per cell enhancement. 
So having a very large parcel enhancement drops these spin contours. And that's actually where we would like to place information, where it lives relatively long, like hundreds micro, uh, microsecond. And that's really a long time when you could do lots of uh, operations. So that's something to take into account. Uh, there is no free lunch. But again, that's true when you look at relatively uh, low pumps below the saturation level. So how we can explain it? Why actually spin contours drops uh, with, uh, with increase of the pure self, pure self factor. So again, this is the reminder. This is uh, S equals zero subsystem, S equal one subsystem. There is this non-radiative channel. And uh, that's where you have this thermal equilibrium when you switch optical light. When you uh, uh, switch in on your optical pump, you basically convert from S equal one to S equal zero. So, but uh, what pure cell does, what this plasmonic environment does, that increases the uh, probability of radiation uh, channel. Because when you have hypercell factor, meaning you have many photonic density of states into which this photon could be emitted. The larger the density of states, the higher probability of radiative channel. But that means that you break a symmetry between fluorescence for S equals zero and fluorescence for S equal one. The whole asymmetry occurs due to non-radiative channel. But if the relative role of non-radiative channel becomes smaller as compared to radiative channel, then contrast should drop. Imagine if I would switch off completely this non-radiative channel, then there would, the contrast would be zero. There would be difference in emission between these two channels. Therefore, it's not surprising that uh, when we increase uh, when, when we increase the Purcell factor, and therefore the probability of radiative channel. Uh, you have actually smaller contrast simply because of that the relative role of non-radiative channel which creates the spin contrast decreases. And that's exactly what is summed up here. So higher local density of states, higher photonic density of states, which results from these surface plasma polaritons with more uh, states into which this emission could occur, which results in higher radiative rates. And that means less contrast because the relative role of non-radiative channel becomes smaller. So that's the conclusion that when you design your quantum system and uh, there are different processes and for purely optical part, pure cell, the higher per cell factor, the better. You could really have this dramatic in increase in, for example, in generation of single photon as we looked into uh, last time. However, in terms of spin contrast, and that's uh, the quantum information, quantum memory uh, unit, uh, that actually could become less. So that's a question of the right design in this case. So something, um, something to really carefully look at. But again, looking at very high saturation, uh, changing this story, but that's still uh, what we are studying. So hopefully uh, within half a year, uh, maybe shorter time, we will have answer to that. There is a hope that in this case, actually, uh, you could take a big advantage of spin contrast. Sorry, of this hypercell factor. Anyway, so that's something interesting and shows that life is not as simple as one uh, might think. So, and, uh, but that makes it even more exciting. Well, the other part for all this type of approach, as I pointed out, how we could precisely, uh, position nano diamonds and how we could scale this technique. Because currently what people largely do, they use this AFM tip. And tip this just pushes this nano diamond and takes not hours, sometimes days to find out to manage to place a nano diamond in the right position. Very time consuming. And it's, it, 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 it's, 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 it's quite pain on neck to do this. Could we just in a, a controllable way to place antennas, to place, sorry, these nano diamonds in every single point we want to, like in parallel, many of them. And it turns out it's possible and my, uh, and, and uh, actually, Professor Baltasova students justice accomplished right that. He just uh, became a professor at the University of Vanderbilt, uh, starting from this fall. But it's a purely elegant uh, uh, solution he found, which works amazingly well. It has to do with this uh, um, non antennas and how to place particles into hot spots of non antennas. Well, it's known that you could trap a particle by non-antenna. If you have non-antenna, you have very high gradient of electrical fields. And that works as a trapping force. Basically, gradient of electrical field means that you could uh, trap a particle there. And that's what many groups did. Uh, and there are many, like in Spain, in France groups, which would create this, use this optical antenna, radiate it. And when you radiate it, 
you create a high gradient of field so that when particle randomly works in solution typically, and finally, uh, uh, accidentally would reach this uh, uh, non-antenna, which works as optical trap. It would be trapped there. So, but in this case, you basically rely on random walking. It's so uh, slow process, and you just do it one by one. Could you do it in a uh, kind of more intelligent way? And the solution that was suggested by Justice, as I mentioned, and it's a truly elegant one. In addition to optical excitation of these non-antennas, plasmonic antennas, he suggested to add uh, AC voltage. And it turns out it makes a huge difference how it works in this case. Because you irrigate it with light, you actually create areas uh, where temperature uh, jumps up. Because when you excite this uh, surface, plasma, uh, surface plasmons in nano-antennas, uh, you locally increase the temperature. But because of increasing the temperature, uh, you actually have change in conductivity. So the point here, that when you irrigate these antennas, uh, you create a gradient in temperature, which result which in turn results in gradient in conductivity. So, and when you have a gradient of conductivity, if, if you apply voltage, you have these strong vortices. So instead of this random walking of particles, now we have vortices, which in the matter of seconds, bring particles right to this non-antenna. As soon as this nanodiamond reaches uh, a particular antenna, it gets trapped there because of these high gradient forces. So, and that's the very simple idea, and basically he, just the only thing he added to what other people did is to uh, put to, to, to put here this voltage because he realized that these antennas create a gradient of temperature which would result in gradient of conductivity or permittivity and that would uh, by putting uh, by setting some voltage that would create these vortices and that works amazingly fast instead of doing it days with AFM tip so actually within seconds you place all these antennas in this in, in, in the position where, sorry, place these nano-diamonds in the positions where you have these nano-antennas. So no matter where you want to have your nano-diamond be placed, you put all these antennas, you fabricate them, and then you irrigate it with light and uh, uh, set some voltage, and then particles go right, right there. And when you switch off light, they still stay there because of Van der Waals forces. So with this way, you place nanodiamonds right on these antennas, and you could do it in parallel, like thousands of them if you want. So this is really fast and precise delivery to plasmonic hotspots. It's very high resolution, uh, nanoparticle trapping res resolution defined by the size of this antenna, which could be very small. And you could immobilize a trapped object by switching off light, basically because of underwalls it stay there. And what the important is actually large scale, you, you have in this case large scale parallel assembly. So that's, uh, that's work actually uh, attracted lots of attention from uh, this quite large community working on trapping of particles in small antennas. So it's a, I would say kind of disruptive uh, uh, solution proposed by Justice and everybody now appreciates it as, as a very elegant way. So that solves the other part. I mean, the first part was, uh, to look at how plasmonic environment controls uh, the spin contrast, and the other one, how to place on a diamond in a particular uh, spot. So yet another, the third one, it's integrated single photon detector. Because remember, we would like this light create certain uh, spin state, so then we would send this information, which eventually would like to detect. So you write and read information about spin state you create, uh, optically in this case, but you would like to do it with single photons, and for that you need single photon detector. So this work we did with uh, a Russian group, uh, and specifically two key uh, people, uh, uh, Akimov, who is now actually professors, a professor in Texas University A&M, and, uh, and Professor Goldsman in Moscow. So uh, we use this uh, superconducting uh, uh, single photon detector, which turns out to be very efficient and going way beyond to what uh, has been accomplished so far in terms of these single photon detectors. So for that, uh, uh, we use this um, uh, superconducting material, this uh, niobium nitride, and we make a meander of that. The thickness of this uh, strip is just only four nanometers, the width is 120, but the whole length is like 100 microns. It's very long. So this is superconducting under. 
So, and you purposely, you, you work at temperatures when you are uh, at the superconducting stage. And what happens when uh, your photon is absorbed, like single photon is absorbed, you locally create area where uh, you actually go above the superconducting uh, point. So basically you switch from superconducting to conventional conducting point. And of course that results in uh, dramatic change in uh, resistance and in voltage, and you detect it. And it turns out the characteristics of such uh, single photon detector is really remarkable. The jitter time, which defines how actually, uh, how fast your photo detect is 62 picosecond, which is six times smaller with, uh, than a photo detector typically used. It's silicon based, uh, avalanche photo detector. Six times smaller, meaning that it's, you could detect it much faster. The low duck counts is basically the background. We would like to have it as, uh, as, as low as possible, meaning that so that counts basically when you detect something when you shouldn't detect. In this case, it's thousand times smaller than in uh, silicon uh, avalanche photo detector. And the dynamic range, dynamic range uh, tells you how many photons per second you could detect is up to 350 uh, million counts per second. So which is 60 times broader than uh, in the case of silicon avalanche photo detector. So it's in, in all characteristics, it's actually uh, seems to be very good. And it designed so that the highest efficiency actually in the visible range, and that's where this nitrogen vacancy actually emits. So because there are very good photo detectors for 1.5, and it is indeed very important, but as I pointed out, Many things, many operations might be easier to do in the visible and then convert it to teleco. So this uh, single photon detector was specifically designed and engineered to work in the visible so that it would be able to detect single photons emitted by nitrogen vacancies. So and to test this, uh, uh, we just used this hyperbolic material which we developed in our group. Remember it consists of this plasmonic material, titanium nitride, this uh, plasmonic layers with dielectric layers, aluminum scandium nitride in between, and you have like 20 of these layers, and all this is like a, a single super lattice. So it's really single crystal structure. As I pointed out, it's very amazing uh, uh, system, and all is grown in magnesium oxide, which, lattice, which matches the lattice. And we looked at the uh, emission from these nitrogen vacancies, and with this photo detector, we actually were able to detect this G2, which clearly shows that indeed we have single photons because it drops down close to zero. So that was success, uh, that allowed us to successfully test this, uh, uh, single photon, uh, uh, superconducting photo detector by using this plasmonically enhanced nitrogen vacancy center. So to sum up what we uh, discussed most lately, so with uh, hyperbolic metamaterials, and this is just one of the approaches, but as I pointed out, it's unorthodox. It doesn't involve any particular resonance, therefore doesn't involve any particular absorption. And therefore it doesn't involve slowing down because the sharper the resonance, the slower response typically. By using these hyperbolic metamaterials, which have very high density of states because of the topology, remember in this case, isofrequency surface is given by this hyperbolic surface, uh, in K space, and because of that you have very large density of state. You actually could significantly, dramatically increase emission of nitrogen vacuum, emission coming from um, quantum emitters, well, in particularly nitrogen vacancy emission, but it doesn't have to, of course, nitrogen uh, vacancy, it could be anything. However, most of energy in this case goes into propagating modes with high K, uh, where wave vector K is larger than omega over C. It means that it's a challenge to outcouple them. They propagate, they uh, carry on uh, energy, but they propagate within hyperbolic materials. And this was proposed by my uh, undergraduate students. So remember, Oksana, we actually suggested to make these grooves in hyperbolic material. And uh, she managed to show that actually in this case, 50 times higher collection of fish, uh, the, uh, the number of collected single photons going to photo detector. So, and uh, nitrogen vacancy ensembles at low excitation, meaning below saturation, I pointed out. So what we observed that speed contrast actually drops when it increases the emission enhancement. So when you have this hypercell factor, the uh, emission increases, 
as I've reported out. However, uh, the spin contrast drops. So it's basically trade-off and you have to find the optimal conditions. So we need to optimize per cell and to use structures with improved collection efficiencies. And so, as I also pointed out, there is this very efficient, rapid deterministic positioning of nanodiamonds on plasmonic structures, uh, which uh, can be accomplished by what we call hybrid electrothermoplasmonic effects. Basically, in this case, you have this quantum emitters plus uh, laser field, which uh, uh, which uh, excites all the surface plasma in, in antennas, and it is all create this ingredient of temperature, plus AC. That was actually uh, the, uh, the uh, wonderful idea of Justice to at AC, and as a result, you create these vortices and have very fast delivery. And what, what blocks? Something, for whatever reason, we don't see it, but basically we also demonstrated this uh, single photon photodetector with truly excellent characteristics which detects in the visible part of the spectrum. And uh, that's the three ingredients. It's not like it solves all the problem, but those are three uh, quite important ingredients for uh, quantum nanophotonics. Of course, I should admit that we would like to work at room temperature. So all these components done at room temperature. As for the single photon detector, it's still superconducting, meaning it works at low temperature. How to do single photon detect at room temperature, it's still a challenge. So we are thinking about this. But at least for having proof of uh, concept, proof of notion, that uh, might be a good start. Uh, well, and uh, to end this particular part, uh, uh, I'd like to try to provide uh, you with some kind of outlook. Uh, how actually this integrated and scalable quantum information system could uh, could look in, in, in future. So that's what many groups work in. Quite often they work on particular aspects of this, but actually it's probably time now to start looking, as I pointed out, at material platform and also how it would look in general, how it would operate. So when it comes down to quantum communication, one of the key advantages, that, and this is a very important theorem in quantum uh, field, that uh, you cannot copy quantum state. Because when you read a uh, quantum state, you actually uh, change it. Which means that in principle, with this quantum approach, you could accomplish absolute security, which is impossible with any classical way. And quantum security, this is one of the biggest, uh, most perhaps attractive part for all this uh, quantum communication. So you be, what, as people in this field usually use, uh, you uh, usually use this example, you send information from Alice to Bob, and so you want to ensure that that information was not taken uh, somewhere uh, on the way uh, by bad guys. So in, in which this grand challenge is actually to build a practical integrated platform for quantum information sensing. So it's really important to provide safer data transfer, as I pointed out, and storage for numerous applications. That's actually a key thing. And in, the, in this effort, focus is currently on key parameters, so to realize it for these realistic materials, like room temperature operations, scalability, efficiency, robustness, cost, and things like that. But the whole system, uh, which consists from a transmitter, receiver, and repeater, uh, it would have all these components which listed here, which are very critical, like frequency conversion, because if you do some operation in the uh, visible, uh, then you have to convert to telecom, and in my opinion, it's almost unavoidable. Of course, you need to have quantum memory. We just discussed the spin degree of freedom, spin contrast, how you could create and control it. To prove that you're dealing with quantum superposition, you do this Bell state measurements because Bell state uh, uh, proves that you have something not classical uh, quantum state. So you have to have a source of entangled photons, single photon entangled photons, single photon detector, which just discussed one of the way of efficient single photon detector. You need to have a pump laser, quantum gate switch, and CMOS electronics because it's still going to be hybrid. All these components. That's the way it uh, might look like, uh, how this quantum information, uh, uh, quantum communication could be handled. So this is a, kind of like a roadmap, if you wish, like vision, uh, although other groups might have some different visions. And you could, as you could see, there are many things to accomplish, which would be uh, particular components of these quantum information systems. But there is tremendous progress, and uh, we are not really that far. 
yeah, in my opinion. So, so we are getting there to, 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 to process information with uh, help of quantum photonics uh, as like basically quantum photonic circuitry. In a, in a similar way as we do is with electronics, but here you take advantage of all this uh, quantum superposition, entangled states, uh, quantum speed up, as people say. So, and again, the challenge is, uh, and the truth, uh, to create this integrated, scalable quantum information system, it's basically we need to bring together advances from different areas uh, on a single platform. What I mean by these advances, because we need to have memory, we have, we could, we should be able to control light matter interactions, to have strong coupling, which is in the heart of all these quantum applications. We need to have sources, single and entangled photons. We need to have detectors, as I pointed out, logical gates, frequency conversion. If we do some of operation in the visible, and that's most probably what's going to happen, and. Uh, in the end, we have, we need to have this device interconnection schemes to enable scalability. So it's really important that you could make it uh, in, in, in large scale. So in, when you're doing so, you have to consider these challenges from both a device level and a system level. Here, just an illustration showing how you could convert the pump, let's say invisible, like single photon invisible, into single uh, photon a telecom by uh, uh, coupling this, this is interconnect like waveguide, you couple it to some uh, ring resonator with large chi 3 you have this four wave mixing, and then one of the frequencies at telecom would couple to this ring and eventually go to this, uh, to, to this uh, waveguide, optical waveguide that let's say presumably would be telecom, and this is, would be another frequency uh, called Tidler. Oh, that would be signal, this is Tidler, I'm sorry, this is telecom, this is and this is Isla. So there are many, many ingredients, as I pointed out, uh, pointed out at the level of devices and the system that it could be, uh, uh, that have to be thought through. But at least this is kind of vision uh, for how the whole system could look like. And, and this is just lists up the challenges and uh, some particular ingredient, how you could handle this conversion. And uh, I would say in the heart of all these different things, uh, it's actually what uh, the problem is that has to be solved with strong coupling. As I pointed out, it's a very critical to all have this advantage like single photon switch, single photon rerouter. You need to have this, what people call strong coupling, quantum coupling. And that eventually comes down to, to have as large as possible what people call cooperativity number, or basically per cell factor, they're proportional to each other. And remember that's about Q, quality fact of your resonator, uh, and the rest uh, divided by volume. So you would like to have as large as possible Q and as small as possible volume to have strong coupling. And in that regard, perhaps a smart hybrid approach could make a difference, although it's still to be demonstrated. Like in this case, you have this a photonic crystal consistent of this periodical array of holes. It could be thought of as a photonic crystal. And then you have a defect here, like an absent hole or smaller in size hole. That would act as a photonic cavity with rather high quality factor. But still, the size would be diffraction limit. So what I'm doing first, create a photonic resonator uh, by using this notion of a uh, defect in a photonic crystal with very high Q, but volume would be relatively large because it's uh, defined by the wavelengths. And within this optical cavity, in addition, I place plasmonic structure, like non-antenna. In this case, Q is not as high, but volume could be very small, like five nanometer. So, and in the zero approximation, if you uh, decouple this system, although that it's just zero approximation, you could would have uh, the product of uh, pure cell factors from photonic cavity when you have very large Q and from plasmonic antenna where you have very small, small volume. You basically take advantage of both worlds. This is kind of hybrid system which in principle could result in this exceptionally strong uh, coupling. And that's in the heart of all this quantum application as uh, I pointed out. So in general, we could say that this is just like one idea, but uh, what we need in general is utilize the advantage of photonics, electronics, and plasmonics 
to achieve high performance. And to do this, we need to explore new materials. I pointed out how it's critical to have the right material platforms. And people only now started to think what would be the right combination, what would be this uh, material platform for quantum photonics. Uh, we need to look at new quantum emitters, such as atomic defects, uh, new structures to optimize uh, 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 all this uh, interoperability and performance. So there are lots of challenges, but also there is lots of progress, I should say. And the challenges are in actually different uh, areas, materials, uh, fundamental studies, and uh, like fundamental optics, uh, including single photons and tangle photons, strong coupling. And I tried to overview, of course, we uh, could not go into details, but at least I showed you the areas where people trying to focus uh, their efforts now. And then hopefully we would be able to integrate it to it one to uh, quantum photonic circuitry. So conclusion for all this quantum photonics part, which we cont uh, consider during the three uh, lectures. So there is a huge effort now in terms of uh, optimizing current material. Well, we looked at the current material platforms. Remember, we talked about silicon, silicon nitride, uh, silicon carbide, diamonds, uh, quantum dots, uh, and other system. And they all have certain pros and cons. And uh, the at least uh, in my uh, opinion, what looks very promising is to use these new plasmonic materials because in this case you could take advantage of plasmonics with exceptionally small small volumes. And small volumes are very critical for realizing quantum phenomena. And use these the most compatible uh, plasmonic materials that recently developed in uh, several groups. So therefore this alternative plasmonic materials in a new hybrid platform for quantum photonics uh, seems to be quite promising. So we looked at enhanced single photon sources by using this idea of hyperbolic metamaterials. It's not the only way uh, to have this increased uh, uh, enhanced single photon sources, but at least it looks quite efficient and interesting way. So we look at schemes for one chip quantum register, like uh, reading this spin contrast and then uh, uh, looking at how it depends on the plasmonic environment. And so we also look at the general system-like approach for this quantum information system for room temperature, scalable and integrated devices. So again, uh, there are more questions than answers probably, but that's what makes this uh, field so exciting and interesting. Uh, uh, the goal of this overview was uh, indicate uh, what are the biggest challenges where uh, leading groups are now putting their efforts on and what we could expect eventually uh, from this quantum photonic circuitry.